What is going on, everybody? John Middlecoff, 3 and Out Podcast. That's me. Go subscribe to the podcast. We are also live on AMP. Go check that out right now, live on AMP, live on YouTube. Make sure you subscribe to the page. And like I said, podcast, 3 and Out. If you like it, subscribe. <laughs> Crazy football. Let's go. Okay. I uh, After watching the Giants beat the Washington football team commanders or whatever you want to call them tonight. I have officially put it in my ballot, even though I don't have one for the coach of the year. And I think for any coach, what you do with less and ultimately get a result of more is more impressive than doing a lot with really good players. Now to become a really good coach, Bill Walsh, Bill Parcells, Bill Belichick, you name it. Any coach that's winning has good players. So you cannot have success in the NFL. You cannot have success in college if you don't have blue chip guys. We all understand that. But tonight, Brian Dayball beating the Washington Commanders, I don't see how you even argue it. He's my coach of the year. If he makes the playoffs, especially as the sixth seed, so even with the new seeding that added seventh team, he would have made it in the old structure. That is beyond impressive. Nick Sirianni is about to go 16 and one, potentially, if he beats Dallas. Let's say he goes 15 and two. Regardless, that's an unreal season. Sirianni has been awesome. Kyle Shanahan might win 13 games with three separate quarterbacks starting. And he's going to finish the season winning several games with the Mr. Irrelevant as a starting quarterback. But when you open the Philadelphia Eagles and the San Francisco 49ers garages, they are full of Ferraris. If I went to the New York Giants garage, it's full of jalopies. Maybe an F-150 in Saquon Barkley, but a bunch of jalopies. And what this guy is doing with not much. They don't have wide receivers. They don't have DBs. They have a quarterback who is average at best. And even that feels like a stretch. Good guy, tries hard, pretty limited. They have Saquon Barkley, who is obviously when he's healthy, is a phenomenal talent. How is this possible? Now, Kayvon's the fifth pick in the draft. And really quick, I had a buddy in the NFL shoot me a tweet. I think uh, it it was from Mina Kimes, works at ESPN. And she was not alone. A lot of people on the Twitter sphere, when Kayvon was making all these plays, were going, this is a good example of not letting the draft discourse distract you from the good players. Kayvon Thibodeau was the fifth pick in the draft. So were there questions about him coming out of Oregon? Yes, there were. Too stiff. Does he play hard? He went fifth. He did not fall into the third round. He was the fifth overall pick. A couple other recent fifth round picks come to my mind. Jamar Chase, Khalil Mack. Being drafted fifth is pretty damn impressive. And when you redraft this year, to me, the highest he would go is fourth. So he went really high. He made some plays tonight. He was awesome. And obviously him and Saquon are high-end talents. Other than that, the Giants do not have many. I remember when Harbaugh took over the 49ers. Year one, he got him the NFC Championship. It was impressive, but it turns out that team was loaded with Pro Bowl players. A couple years ago, LaFleur gets the Packer job, and they had 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 a bad, basically, season and a half. Well, he did inherit Aaron Rodgers and Devontae Adams, and, you know, Aaron kind of flipped it back, and they turned out to be pretty good really fast. But those teams had blue chip level Hall of Fame guys. This Giants team, let me read you off the wins from 17 till last year. Three, five, four, six, four. Not a math major, do have a couple degrees. If you take those five years, you add it up and you divide it by five, that's an average of 4.4 wins a season. The Giants have been god awful for a half decade. And you watch them right now. And if you watch them play all season long, they have no business making the playoffs. None at all. But Brian Dable, and I've said it for a long time, is like these Belichick guys, they just stay under his umbrella. And he's all that they know. And I I don't even blame them. What are they supposed to do when they get these opportunities? You just emulate what you know, right? It's like when a lot of us leave the nest and go to college, We kind of get to spread our wings and figure out things that we didn't know when you live with your parents. And Belichick kind of plays that role with a lot of those coaches. 
I was watching the Raider game today. Who's on the sideline with Mac Judge or Mac Jones? Joe Judge and Matt Patricia. Because what happened? They both get shit canned and they go running back. And Brian Dayball left the nest. And he went to Sean McDermott and Josh Allen in Buffalo for four years. And hell, he competed against Belichick. And he learned and he figured it all out. And look at him now. You know, he's a guy in his late 40s, short, bald, kicking ass and taking names. Loved his look tonight. Shaved his goatee, had the hoodie on, and just beat a team that has dramatically more talent than them. The three wide receivers would be by far the best skill guys besides Saquon Barkley on the New York Giants. Their defensive line, they don't even have Chase Young and is awesome. They have really good players. Now, their quarterback situation is iffy. But so is the Giants. You could argue Heineke is more talented. Now he's a little bit more of a roller coaster ride. Historically, Daniel Jones always was. Turned the ball over a lot. But he's done a much better job with Dayball. Heineke clearly at any moment can fumble, can throw a pick. But he also can throw like a 60-yard bomb, as he should. They got sweet skill guys. But that win tonight was was really, really impressive. And, And now the Giants, if they can just find a way to get one more win, uh, they basically, obviously, they would finish above 500. And uh, now they're guaranteed to finish at worst 8-8-1, eight, eight, and one, which I, I'd even argue coming off a four-win season, a four-win improvement. Like I said, I'm taking nothing away from Nick Sirianni that's going to win 15 or 16 games. He's done a freaking awesome job. What Kyle Shanahan has done this year with quarterback after quarterback going on and headed toward 12 or 13 wins, awesome job. But what Brian Dayball is doing is more impressive. He doesn't have all-stars and pro bowlers and 20 to $30 million players at several positions. He's dealing with a bunch of randoms. Let's face it. If you're not a Giants fan or you're not, you know, inundated in the NFC East, if I told you Saquon Barkley and Daniel Jones, you're not allowed to, you couldn't name five New York Giants. This is not the Tom Coughlin, Eli teams. This is a team full of random guys who are average players who are overachieving because of their coaching staff. And to me, Brian Dayball, I feel very, very confident saying it's one of the better coaching jobs in recent memory. And the Washington Commanders, like, that, that's a devastating loss. You, you just can't lose that game at home. And I, I think you see one thing immediately, and I know he's technically not calling plays, Mike Kafka is, but Brian Dayball's influencing the offense. He's obviously influencing the team. Like, having, if you're going to have a CEO head coach, I like him to be on offense. And this league is becoming, it's its ever more important to have offensive coaches. And you have to wonder, you know, if Washington misses the playoffs and they still control their own destiny, but the Lions are coming. Washington plays the 49ers next week. They're in major trouble. Now, if they fired Ron Rivera, the ownership's in flux. What are they even going to do? This feels like a franchise that it felt like they were taking a step forward, you know, a couple weeks ago and it looked like, God, Washington's going to make the playoffs. And now it felt like in one game at home against a division rival who has left talent, less talent than you, immediately takes a step back. And that that shows you in this league (laughs) how important coaching is and how important the head coaches are. It's why the best head coaches make 15 to 20 million dollars. It's why. And speaking of a guy that, you know, listen, he might make 20 million dollars. I've had just some time to let it really resonate that final play. And I saw cowards, you know, and I've seen a lot of people that just said Bill Belichick should have knelt it. And I'm a huge believer is that anything that happens on the field is ultimately on the coaches. Cause as Belichick has this famous saying in, in the football world of you're either coaching it or allowing it to happen. I do think every once in a while, a player can go rogue. A player can kind of not think straight and do something so moronic, so idiotic that it turns into that final play. And I think you can question Belichick, you know, running a play when you run that play where you throw it and everyone starts lateraling it back rugby style, you typically, the first part of that play is either a screen or like when the defense is way off toward the end zone and you start running it down, it's never based on a run play. So doing a run play, I just thought maybe they, or I think that they thought, let's just see how far we can go and then play for overtime. He'll hit the ground, whatever he pitches it back. And even Jacoby, after the game in the locker room said, like, I I don't know what I was doing. I was playing hero ball. And there's a reason why on that play, a lot of times, anyone that gambles knows that's when you have the crazy swings. When a team is covering, then all of a sudden you throw it to the other team and they score. It it happens several times a year. 
usually when a team is down five or six points with no time left and they got to go 60, 70 yards. Not in this scenario. And I'm not trying to defend Belichick because, listen, it's his statement. You're either coaching or allowing it to happen. And any players, like, they got to know better. And clearly the Patriots don't feel quite as buttoned up. Maybe it's as simple as, listen, I'm not the most religious guy, but I do believe in the football gods. And the football gods have been screwing the Raiders now for decades. And famously, the Patriot dynasty started once upon a time uh, with a tuck rule. And that involved the Raiders. And listen, the Raiders are five and eight, and they celebrated that game like they just won the Super Bowl. They're six and eight, and they're going to finish under 500 more than likely. And the Chiefs just won their seventh straight division. Can there be a better job right now than Andy Reid and Patrick Mahomes have? They go, so wait, our division has Mark Davis and the Raiders. We have Dean Spanos and Brandon Staley and the Chargers. And then we got these idiots in Denver and this contract that's terrible, and they got to find a new coach. I'm like, you talk about a division. Remember forever when the Patriots, it was like, God, the Jets are in shambles. Miami's not any good. This is before Josh Allen. The Bills were a joke. And it was like, this isn't even fair. Well, the Chiefs, it's like, how are they ever going to not win the division? Honestly, how are they ever going to not win the division? It took the biggest miraculous ending in the history of football for the Raiders to win a football game against a average at best Patriot team. And uh, I, I just truly believe that the Patriot players went rogue. The holidays are here. Can I tell you about my friends at Omaha Steaks? Because if you want to get someone a gift, if you want to bring a gift to a party, if you want to be the star of the show, just go to Omaha Steaks because they've put together a delicious selection of various gift packages to make shopping for the ones that you love nice and easy. Go to omahasteaks.com and take advantage of the 50% off site-wide. Plus, if you use the promo code three and out, that's the number three and out at checkout, you'll get an additional $40 off. You can't beat it. They have everything you need for a great gift. Butcher's cut filet mignon, air chilled boneless chicken, ultra juicy burgers, and easy to prepare comfort meals that are ready in a flash. Listen, shopping for brothers, shopping for fathers, shopping for cousins is not easy. Trust me. Omaha Steaks is a gift from the heart, a gift that will be remembered with every unforgettable bite. Order with complete confidence today, knowing your order, ordering the very best. Visit omahasteaks.com, take advantage of 50% off site-wide, plus use the promo code 3 and out at checkout to get an extra $40 off your order. Minimum order may be required. Okay, where do we start? We had, uh, we had a bananas morning on Sunday. I'll, I'll get to the Saturday games, really two of the three of them, here in a minute, but... Sunday morning with the Jags and the Cowboys and the Jets and the Lions was absolutely fantastic. I I, I was glued. And uh, let's start with the Jags and the Cowboys. And I'll get to the Cowboys here in a second. Uh, it's, they didn't necessarily lose the division today, but they kind of did. The Eagles just have to win one game of the f- remaining three. This game now coming up on Saturday is not nearly as big. Uh, the Cowboys kind of screwed us. You know, it felt like the Eagles were going to drop it too. And it felt like the Cowboys were going to win and be like, God, there's going to be a lot on the line come uh, come this week. Eagles, Cowboys, big boy game. And then the Eagles pulled it out and the Cowboys blew it. And now this game doesn't feel remotely as important. Why? Because it's not. But one thing that is important, when the draft in the NFL is a really big deal, and when it comes to quarterbacks getting drafted number one, those guys carry uh, – legacy is the wrong way to put it, but th- there is like uh, – there's just a way that we talk about those guys uh, because when you're drafted number one overall, you're viewed as a franchise savior. And historically, they've been very hit or miss. Now, not all number one overall picks are the same, right? Kyler Murray had to transfer out of Texas A&M and go to Oklahoma. Baker Mayfield was a walk-on, right? Jared Goff got to one bowl game. So everyone's plight to the number one overall pick at quarterback can be different. And every once in a while, we get these can't miss all-time quote-unquote prospects. In the last decade, I think we've really had two. Andrew Luck was viewed as a can't-miss guy. The moment he got to the NFL, it was clear, he's on your team, I don't give a shit who he's playing with, you're going to the playoffs. Trevor Lawrence was viewed in that vein. And I think one thing I try to do, whether it's players or whether it's people, not all of us mature or are on the same path professionally. Some guys are ready to kick ass and take names. Theo Epstein was a GM at 28. Right, The majority of people are not equipped mentally or physically or emotionally to handle 
certain jobs, whether it's football, whether it's a major league baseball GM, whether it's a CEO of a company. And then some guys are. And we saw that Trevor Lawrence, like, you could argue no one, I don't care how talented you are, could have handled last season. Urban Meyer, all-time joke NFL coach. You could argue the biggest joke NFL coach we've ever seen. He spent one year in the NFL, literally it's his only year ever professionally in the NFL as a coach, and he did not last the season. He basically lasted, you know, 10 and a half months or 11 months, right? He got fired before the season ended. It, it was an embarrassment. And Trevor Lawrence, who came from a program that was, you know, right there with Alabama, now Georgia, Ohio State is like the model of success. You go to Clemson, you kick ass, you take names. And he was viewed by their coach as Michael Jordan. Right or actually, that was Deshaun Watson. But this guy, if if Deshaun Watson was Michael Jordan, what the hell was Trevor Lawrence? Right, Babe Ruth. And I questioned it even this year because early on in the season, it was somewhat of a roller coaster. He had some devastating interceptions in some games that that cost the Jacks. Right, but as you saw today, his talent is pretty immense, and now he has a coach that hasn't just exceeded or, I mean, won at the highest level and exceeded expectations in his career, right, with the Eagles, and then even the following year when they won a playoff game at Chicago. But he's a former quarterback. And Noah and Doug, like, he's a pretty even-keel guy. And you watch Trevor Lawrence, like, just as time has gone, he has gotten much better. And now if you just take, like, the last month, he's played fantastic football. And really the last two weeks, he's thrown seven touchdowns. And today, like, the talent was on full display. The arm strength, the movement ability, he can avoid sacks, he can keep plays alive, he's accurate, he's a playmaker, uh, he, he's very athletic, but he never feels out of control. He looked today against the Cowboys like the total package. And I think ideally, we want everyone to hit the ground running. We're all guilty of that, right? Especially when the hype is really high on all these players. Some guys can come in to pro sports, Shaquille O'Neal, LeBron James, Ken Griffey Jr., Tiger Woods, and kick the shit out of everyone immediately. Some guys will take some time, right? Peyton Manning, Google his stats. It wasn't pretty early on. And especially when you go to teams that are not successful. Most people go to Jacksonville over the last couple of decades and do not have success. And Trevor Lawrence now feels like he's overcoming that. Now, they did a good job hiring Doug Peterson. They got a real coach around him. They obviously have some talent around them. Now, with Tennessee losing, they actually have a chance to make the playoffs. I would still probably bet against it. But the way Trevor Lawrence is playing relative to the way Tannehill and that offense is playing in Tennessee, I don't think you can discount it. Like the Jags are going to be way better in two years from now than they are right now. You could argue that this guy is only scratching the surface. Confidence builds on each other, right? So like once you start having success in any profession, that experience just kind of snowballs. It becomes like an avalanche of just of confidence, of a belief in yourself. And when you're as physically gifted as this guy, like certain guys just don't have the talent, right? We're having a lot of fun with Brock Purdy, but Brock Purdy's has limitations, right? From a height standpoint, from an arm strength standpoint, even when you look around at good quarterbacks, like uh, Kirk Cousins is a good example, who just had an incredible comeback, but physically has some limitations. He can't run away from every, anyone, right? He's, he's not going to make great plays with his legs. He's not going to be able to throw it 70 yards on the run like a Mahomes or a Josh Allen, but he can be really good. But he's maximizing his talent. Imagine if we ever get to the point where Trevor Lawrence can maximize his talent. Watch out. And you saw today, like, the Cowboys' weakness and their main problem right now is early on in the season, the pass rush, whenever I'd watch the Cowboys, just engulfed people. They, you could not get away from them. Their athleticism, their speed, their power up front was, was eye-opening. Obviously, Micah Parsons, who had an early sack in this game, is kind of the total package, Right. Great athlete, can bend, has power, can run you down. And it just felt like every single game, he was all over the quarterback. But he also had help. And now you watch him today, they had one sack in the game. And they were getting pressure on Trevor Lawrence, but because of his athleticism, he could avoid him. And then he sliced and diced him for over 300 yards and four touchdowns. Like, part of, you have to be able to play pass defense in the NFL to, to like, have a good chance to win the Super Bowl. And I said it probably a couple weeks ago, I took the Cowboys seriously. I thought because of their defense, because of their front, because of how solid it was, and listen, I'm not the biggest stack guy, but their offense is more than good enough, and it was today. You're like, well, it ended on a pick six. The pick six bounced off his wide receiver. That, that wasn't the play that took the lead in that game to Noah Brown in regulation. 
before Trevor Lawrence got the ball back after he fumbled and led him on a field goal drive was fantastic. That that was an elite play by Dakota Prescott. And the play that lost him the game, like that's not on the quarterback. Who lost this team the game today was their defense. And that is the reason where, I, I hell, I took them seriously last year. I didn't think the 49ers were going to beat them. And then this year, I've taken them as a team that can, you know, legitimately make some waves in the NFC playoffs. But if their defense is going to be like this, they got no chance. None. <laughs> you know? And part of having a great defense, typically, like most teams do not have Deion Sanders and, uh, you know, Darrell Revis at, at corner and Ed Reed at safety. Most teams, like the 49ers, have a quote-unquote great defense relative to the rest of the NFL. Who's their best DB? Tarverius Ward, really good player. Then they're rolling with Hufungas and Jimmy Wards and other random corners, right? They, they, they dominate with their front. And the front, a defensive pass rush, especially when you can only run or only rush, you know, three or four guys, you don't have to blitz to create pressure. That's the best coverage in the NFL. I saw Richard Sherman tweeting about this like last week. Nothing makes coverage look better than a great pass rush. And right now the Cowboys just aren't as dominant as they were. They better figure it out because clearly the division's over. Like, I'm sorry, the Cowboys are no longer winning the NFC East. You could argue they never were, but it was like statistically, uh, they they definitely had a shot. That That's that's not happening now. Uh, but, uh, you know, they, they're, they're going to get Tampa in the first round. That's a win. But after that, like, I, I, I look at them a little differently. Let's get to the Jets and the Lions. And I, I want to start with the coaching. And when I think Robert Sala and definitely Dan Campbell, I think uh, just really aggressive. I, I think guys pedal to the metal, especially Dan Campbell. Let's start with Dan Campbell. Like, Dan Campbell is not ever going to be some schematic genius. No one is ever going to talk about him like they do Sean McVay, Kyle Shanahan, Sean Payton, Andy Reid. That ain't his deal. He's a leader of men, a tough guy, which can work in the NFL. We've seen John Harbaugh win a Super Bowl have consistent success. We've seen Mike Tomlin not be a defensive coordinator, just be the CEO of his franchise for almost 15 years and never have a losing season, probably until this season. But you can be a great CEO, leader, tough guy. It's this football, right? You, you don't have to be a great schematic guy if you hire good coordinators. And clearly Dan Campbell, this Ben Johnson guy, I was actually on his Wikipedia page today, walk-on quarterback from North Carolina, the fucking Lions, I mean, what he has done with Jared Goff and that offense is fantastic. But if you're going to be CEO guy, like, you got to be aggressive, especially in 2022. And Dan Campbell has talked about it for a year and a half now. The one thing he learned from Sean Payton that was different from the way he was raised under Bill Parcells is going for it. Pedal to the metal, staying aggressive, not being afraid to fail. And today, for the first time all season, like, this was a playoff game. Whoever won this game was going to be in a great position to make the playoffs. And the Lions currently are. But Dan Campbell was 757 left in the game. He had a three-point lead. Was at the Jets 36. So somewhat no man's land. Long field goal, cold weather, probably too long to hit the field goal. But it's fourth and five, so it's not fourth and one, but it's also not fourth and ten. To me, when I think Dan Campbell, he's got to go for it in this situation. Like, you can't all of a sudden puss out when you got a chance to make a playoff run. And that's what it felt like today. He kicks the field goal, and it does feel like all season long, he's been on the wrong side of some of these decisions. He goes for it when it's like, well, you don't even need to go for it now. And then in tight games, he kicks field goals, and it bites him in the ass. And today, he kicks the field goal, which I still can't fathom, misses it, and the Jets go right down the field and score and take the lead. And then, like, he ult obviously they won the game, but to me, that could have cost the Lions the playoffs right there. And then on the flip side, Robert Sala, like I've always defended coaches on game management. I think it's so much easier for us to be sitting on our couches, drinking Gatorades, drinking beers, having some popcorn, eating Snickers, screaming at our television. I'm guilty. You're guilty. We're all guilty. We're also in sweats, t-shirts, and sandals. Right on the sideline, a lot going on. It's not it's not as easy as it looks. But there is also a basic level at the end of a game when things are going fast and you have all your timeouts under two minutes. I think too often coaches get greedy. Like today, with 53 seconds left, the Jets were down three points. It's 20 to 17. Robert Sala, uh, they they get to midfield. They started at like 35, Wilson, or maybe it was like 38 throws a completion, gets to 48, 49-yard line. 
And at 53 seconds, instead of calling a timeout, they don't call their next play till 30 seconds. And then obviously the way the game played out, Wilson pulled a great play out of his ass. They miss a long field goal. And Robert Sala went into the locker room, a loser with a timeout. You can't in that situation on a two-minute drive when you're rushing up to the line and they got lucky at the end of the game that they even had a second left on uh, the play clock for them to be able to call a timeout ever go as a loser to the locker room with a timeout. And to me, Dan Campbell, he's got to hang his hat on having some balls. And today he did not. And Robert Sala, like if you're going to be a playoff level coach, especially when your offense and your quarterback, and we'll get into them in a second, are, you know, are very, very hit or miss. You got to be good with the timeouts. Especially, I mean, you basically have Zach Wilson is like the equivalent of a rookie, right? And in that situation, Robert Sala blew it. And speaking of Zach Wilson, like they, they play on Thursday against the Jags, which is actually a really good game. Uh, I if if it was a normal game and Mike White was cleared, I think you could easily justify benching Zach Wilson going into this Thursday night game and starting Mike White. Like Zach Wilson, if you watch the game, his talent is immense. His ability to scramble around and make crazy throws. His arm's awesome. He has a number two pick in the draft level arm. Like his arm talent, no one argues. Hell, his athleticism and being able to kind of scramble around is really good. But we've seen a million quarterbacks with those two attributes, athleticism and a strong arm, fail in the NFL. Because you know what separates like just really good quarterbacks? I'm not even talking the great ones. Consistency. And being able to make the basic plays, right? Most people that are successful in life, it's not about the extraordinary stuff. It's just about being consistent, doing the same things consistently day in and day out. No different than a quarterback. If you ask Tom Brady or Peyton Manning or Drew Brees, every single year for 20 years or for Tom, 25, that they've been playing, it starts with the fundamentals, right? They start with the basic footwork, uh, pocket awareness, and just the reads, wheel routes, slant routes, out routes. Because if you can't hit the layup passes, you're never going to be able to consistently have success in the NFL. And when I watched Zach Wilson today, he made some plays that were awesome. He ended up throwing for over 300 yards. And he made some really explosive down-the-field plays. But consistently on slant routes, on wheel routes, on basic plays that would have moved the chains, he wasn't anywhere close. So no one in the Jets building is arguing whether he can hit a 50-yard bomb when the guy's wide open. Can you hit a slant route on third and six? Because if you can't, we can't win with you. And right now to me, and I know his yardage looks a little better today, I don't think he's really any closer. Because the, the worry with the Jets was not the explosive plays. Eventually those are going to come. They have too much talent outside. But if he can't do just the remedial stuff, then I, I think you have to question whether he can be the long-term quarterback. And like I, I, I would imagine he ends up playing Thursday just based on the quick turnaround. But if you told me that they benched him and they went back to Mike White because he's cleared with the ribs, you know, I, I'd believe you. And I said on, what would it have been? It would have been on Friday's podcast that this was a big moment for Jared Goff. This game, and then I think they... Uh, or do they, they They still have one. I think they play at Green Bay later in the season. And outdoor games are big for Goff. Now, today, it was cold, but it wasn't raining. It wasn't snowing. It was, you, you could play pitch and catch. But the one thing that jumps out with you when you watch Jared Goff, and ultimately, he's, I would say he's resurrected his career because the bar was pretty low the last several seasons. There are some huge physical limitations. Now, unlike Zach Wilson, he's more likely to hit the wheel route to hit the slant route, which is important. And it's a big reason why the Lions are having a lot of success. They have a lot of talent. You just have to play within yourself. And then occasionally when a big play is there, hit it. But ultimately, the game-winning touchdown today was, you know, every quarterback in the league should be able to make that with his eyes closed. And credit to Jared Goff. He made it. Who knows? Maybe Zach Wilson skips it. I don't know. But there are so many plays today. Like, to me, the Lions could have won that game by several touchdowns. If he can just – he's a – Awful athlete relative to quarterbacks. He might be the worst athlete beside Tom Brady starting at quarterback. So he gives you nothing with his feet. And his arm talent, if he's not set in the pocket, it's it's pretty bad, right? And, and that's where that even if the Lions pull off this miraculous run and get to like nine and eight or ten and seven and get the seven seed, 
because they have the Rams pick and the Rams play the Packers on uh, on Monday Night Football, so that's probably a loss. That I I do think if you like one of these quarterbacks, you know, you probably should take him because your ceiling with Jared Goff this probably as good as it gets. It it, it really is, <laughs> you know. And you're gonna have I mean, Aiden Hutchinson's gonna be a star in the NFL. Okuda's become a really really good player. I mean, St. Brown, Jamison Williams next year, he's getting open with ease right now. And he's not even a year removed from an ACL. So the, the talent, the recoup of, that you're going to have with some of these draft picks is going to be really high. This team is going to be so talented for a long period of time that you don't want to undervalue your upside because of the quarterback. And here's the other thing. Jared Goff's under contract for years to come. You can get out of it every single year if you want to cut him. He makes $26 million next year. He can easily draft one of these guys, C.J. Stroud, Will Levis, redshirt them you know and then eventually make the transition but i think the writing's on the wall uh that raider game was the craziest ending you'll ever see i mean that th- th- there is something special about the reality television that is the national football league every single person i'm on 10 text chains with raider fans other fans that hate the raiders talking shit you go on uh elon's app twitter.com you, you watch the broadcast everyone's like i've never seen this before because I don't think that is possible to witness what we did, right? Because the Patriots, would they have won in overtime? I don't know. I mean, Derek led them on a pretty sweet game tying drive, which we could question whether the game tying touchdown was actually a touchdown. It looked like his feet or his foot was on the white line. But for whatever reason that the replay in Vegas, you couldn't get a close-up view. It sure felt like from the top of the stadium that his foot was on the white line. But for Jacoby Myers to scramble around and throw the ball back to Mac Jones and airmail him by about 50 feet and land in Chandler Jones, ironically, the guy Bill Belichick once traded because he smoked synthetic weed and went naked to a police station. And then for him to truck Mac Jones like he was a middle school kid and walk into the end zone uh, when Josh McDaniels is his coach going back up against Belichick, that, that was... That was an extremely entertaining play. That's that's as good as it gets. And speaking of entertaining, on Saturday morning, you know, I, I wasn't going to lock in to Colts, Minnesota. But I was like, you know, doing some laundry around the office, doing some stuff. 11 o'clock, I was going to go to the gym. I'm like, you know what? I'll, I'll wait and watch the first quarter. And I'm sure like most people, w- within, I mean, less than seven minutes into the first quarter, it was 17 nothing. And the Vikings look like shit. I'm like, you know what? I'm going to go get a workout now. I'll watch or follow it on my phone. And just, we'll check into this thing. And then you keep looking. It's 23 nothing. Gets to 33 to nothing. I stopped paying attention. I'm like, 49ers, number two seed, Minnesota's in shambles. Obviously, the rest is history. They come storming back. Biggest comeback in NFL history. And it's nuts. But let me say this about Minnesota. Because I think it's so easy to diminish success. It, it happens to everybody, right? Oh, this guy got so lucky. Oh, this guy, he just bought some, you know, real estate cheap in 2009. Anyone could have do that. No, actually, no, they didn't. He didn't get lucky. You know, Bill Simmons just started a podcast, you know, back perfect timing. No, it's like they deserve some credit. It's like most people are successful for a reason. Obviously, there are variables with timing, uh, with finances. A lot of things go into anyone's individual success. But for the most part, you show me a successful person, I'll show you 50 people try to diminish what they've accomplished from like 17 different angles. And Minnesota is your classic NFL team where everyone that analyzes football, gambling people, analytical people, just former players, thinks they are very overrated. And in fairness, they have the same record as the Buffalo Bills. They're both 11-3. and To put into perspective a point differential, right, the points you score relative to your opponent over the course of a season, if you're an 11 and three team should be over a hundred. For example, the bills are plus plus one thirty five. That's really good. And I think most would argue when they're on, they might be the best team in the NFL. The Vikings uh, are not quite one thirty five. They are plus two. <laughs> so 11 and three plus two, a statistical anomaly. And I will say this. And a lot of people have argued the statistics for them in these one score games, it's like, you know, a historical outlier. But the reality is the point of football is not to have the best point differential in the in the league. The point of football is to not have the best yards per play or best uh, yards allowed in the running game on third down. Whatever. We can pick a million different statistics, right, to judge your team, to judge your offense or defense, 
to judge, you know, where you stand relative to the NFL. The most important statistic, how many games did you win? How many games did you lose? And for whatever reason, the Minnesota fucking Vikings are 11 and three. So listen, when they were down 33 to nothing, when I walk back into my office and it was 36 to 21 and I look up at Minnesota's driving and watching the rest of that game is one of the most batshit things I've ever seen. It's it's the craziest comeback and it will be statistically probably for, for the rest of the time. It is very, very difficult. Think about this. How many teams get a 33-point lead in the NFL? This is not college football. The chances of even a blowout you having – most blowouts are like 20 points. It's very, very rare. Like how many games this season have been decided by more than 33 points or at any time in a game, a team has had a bigger than 33 point lead. That, that doesn't happen. This is not Alabama playing, you know, Fresno state or Ohio state playing Weber state. This is two NFL teams. So even if you're getting your ass kicked, I watched the Bengals play Tampa. They kind of kick their ass. You look up as 34, 17. Right? You don't usually have these crazy blowouts. So for them to come back, like it's somewhat of a statistical anomaly, but they keep finding ways to win. Now, am I going to pick them to win the NFC? I'm not. But do I think that like they can't win playoff games? You'd be crazy to think that because the most important thing you can have as a team is know how to win. It, you know, I mean, it's why so many average teams, you go eight and nine, it's like, well, if we just would have closed some of those games, because if you're eight and nine, you're probably a fumble, a field goal, and a pick six away from having 11 wins. And we can play that game all day long with Minnesota. Well, fucking, uh, you know, DeForest Buckner just gets his hands on Cousins. And if, if uh, Aaron Rodgers, is, uh, we can do it till the cows come home. But the reality is they're 11-3. and three, And more than likely, they're going to end up 13-4 and four and be the number two seed. And we're going to be nitpicking all their statistics and their point differential. And at the end of the day, they'll be the number two seed. And they're going to play, hell, they might play the Lions. And I would imagine a lot of people are going to bet on the Lions. I might too. But I do think that, like, they just deserve some credit. They have figured out a way to be successful in these tight games consistently. That one, more than some of them, a little bit of luck. Right? You need the other team to fucking implode. Jeff Saturday, Matt Ryan. It's pretty nuts that Matt Ryan is part of the 28-3 game and now the uh, the 33 to nothing game. Like, it's that you, you can't make that up. Like, you could make up. If I would have told you at the beginning of the season that Jeff Saturday would be the interim coach by midseason and there's a 33-point blown lead, you're like, yeah, it wouldn't be crazy if Je that happens to Jeff Saturday, right? Jim Tom Sula, Freddie Kitchens. And I'm not saying he's as big of a joke as those guys because as a person, he's a pretty high-level person, pro bowler. But as a coach, I mean, give me a break. What's he, what's he doing? Staying on the sideline, going up and down? And like I said, I supported, like, he's an interim coach. Who cares? This indie team stinks. They are really, really bad. Uh, but you should never be that bad where you blow a 33-point lead. Like, that's, I mean, I think it's like, I saw Kevin O'Connell say that they said in the locker room at halftime. Uh, I think either his defensive coordinator, some defensive players, like, we'll get stops. We just need you guys to score five touchdowns. He's like, yeah, just score five touchdowns, uh, which is obviously a fantastic half if you can get 35 points. But that game... Turns out wasn't even the game of the day. Uh, the, the the midday game, my only take on the Browns, if you've listened to me long enough, you know, I'm not like moral high horse guy. I, I'm not your typical someone that talks about sports and tries to like, you know, force my, my worldviews in terms of like people. Because I, I just think it's so fake and so disingenuous. So like with the player, this is the NFL. People sign players that are bad guys. The only goal is to win. But I'll be honest, like when I watch Deshaun Watson, I, I just find him like, I just, this whole thing's kind of scummy. You know, it's like, bro, I, I just can't take him seriously. I have a hard time watching Deshaun Watson and not feeling, and, and again, I, I feel like I sound like some of these whack job media people, but I, I feel like kind of gross. And now I didn't, wasn't super locked into that game because I, you have to pay me to watch Brown, the Ravens. I mean, the, the Ravens are the most average nine and five team in the history of the league. That, that that team is a lock one and done. Uh, but I I just something about Deshaun Watson, and I'm like, I don't feel I don't feel right. This feels a little I, I don't know, man. It's just something's off there. Uh, and he doesn't even look that great. Now, I didn't expect him to. He hasn't played in forever. But I'll, I'll be honest, I, I just uh I try to avoid avoid Deshaun Watson as much as I can. The night game was incredible. It it, it really was. 
And I think the overall takeaway with Buffalo is when that guy is on, they're going to be tough to beat. It'd be like if Justin Herbert and Cam Newton had a baby, you'd name him Josh Allen. Because the fucking guy can run and truck guys and run around guys and jump over piles like he's Cam Newton. I mean, Cam Newton is the most physical running quarterback we've ever seen. He's not the fastest. He's not Vic. He's not Lamar. But we've never had a more physical runner, especially in my life of like the, you know, the last 20, 25 years as Cam Newton. And honestly, you would go, probably never seen one again. And I've been to a couple Cam Newton games when I worked in the NFL and when I was around the Raiders. Uh, I actually saw him play the Niners. I've been around him physically in like press conferences. He is an enormous human being. Say, so was Josh Allen. And like Cam, Josh can really run. And he's a natural at it. And when he lets it rip, there is nothing you can do. But unlike Cam, he's actually really accurate. And he throws the ball like a top two or three quarterback in the NFL. So you combine that. And the one year we combined it with Cam, what happened? He won the MVP. So when you can throw like that with that arm strength in a, in a place like Buffalo is a fantastic place to watch a game. You know, I, I think they have a chance over this next, hopefully stays healthy, 10, 15 years of Josh Allen experience. They can kind of be the new Green Bay. As Aaron Rodgers' career kind of comes to a slow end, uh, I think Buffalo will kind of play that role of small town, superstar quarterback. The passion is just elite. The snow games, it's just a... It's an awesome place to watch a night game, especially in winter. And there's something cool about football that just the the elements in the Northeast and the Midwest really come into play this time of year. I, I say it all the time. I hate the cold. I despise it. I'm here in Arizona. I thought it was going to be like 75 in the winter. It's like 40 degrees. I'm like, where, where the hell did I move? I, th- I thought it was warmer in December. It's, it's cold. But the, the snow games, they're special to watch. They're also hard to play in when you can't feel your hands. Uh, and it does not phase the guy. And it honestly doesn't phase a lot of the guys on Buffalo. And I've said it over and over. They get to the Super Bowl, they're, they're going to win it. They're actually built for a dome. <laughs> That's the crazy part of them. They are built to play in a dome. Their front four is extremely fast. Their wide receivers can fly. Their quarterback can throw it 7 million feet in the air. Uh, and obviously he can fly too. Uh, th- that, that was fun to watch. And I'll, I'll give Miami credit because I said it was a gut check game for the two teams on Saturday. It was a gut check game for Minnesota. Uh, having just lost to the Lions, and in a weird way, they answered it as they were getting their ass kicked in the first half. But you, you end up winning the game. Like I said, that's all that matters. And Miami, I honestly thought they would crumble like a cookie. And once you saw some of the weather reports on Saturday uh, morning, you're like, they got no chance, man. How is Tua and that pea shooter arm going to work? And you know what? He played pretty well. He played much better than I thought. Now, still over the middle of the field is pretty questionable with some of his throws. But that go route, and that the, the ball's outside the numbers. He's really, really natural at doing that. And Tyreek Hill, we know how good he is when it comes to playing in the cold. He's done it for half a decade in Kansas City. So it, it's it's easy for him. And the touchdown throw that for one quick second thought that it might be the difference in the game was a beautiful pass. And he made some other big-time plays. And he just played tough. Uh, now, does he have some limitations? Of course he does. I, I do not love him over the middle of the field. I do not love the arm strength. But from a toughness standpoint of just showing up to play in a big game, his team's leaking oil. Uh, now, they got they got a lot of help today, right? Jets losing, the Pats losing. I mean, the Pats, that's, like I said, that's one of the worst losses you'll ever see in your life. Craziest end of the game play ever. Uh, but, you know, Miami's got Green Bay coming up. We know they still play New England. They still play the Jets. So th- they control their own destiny. If they play like they did on Saturday night, they'll make the playoffs. They're in good shape. Uh, but if they, you know, resort back to the Charger game, the Niner game, they're in some trouble. But clearly they're high in Jalen Phillips. I, I really like that guy. I mean, that guy, you can't watch the Miami Dolphins play and not see 15 making plays. But I, I give Tua and I give the Dolphins some 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 credit for showing up in that bad boy.